welcome uh, to the first in the spring series 2021 of nano exploration seminars. Our speaker today is uh, Noel Wan from Professor Dirk England's group. Uh, Noel will join us uh, and actually take over in just a moment, uh, giving the talk on large scale integrated quant photonics with artificial atoms. I wanted to make sure that I welcomed you uh, to the seminar series, uh, reminded you that for the sake of everyone have a slightly faster bandwidth, if you turn off your video and mute yourself, uh, please do so. You can send your questions through the chat throughout the seminar. Uh, those I will make sure I highlight to Noel at the end of the seminar, or at the end of the seminar, uh, you can raise your hand and we'll call upon you and you can ask the question uh, verbally. All right, with that being said, uh, thank you again for joining us. Noel, please take over. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to tell you about the work I've been doing uh, over the past six years and in particular how we can possibly build a uh, large, -scale large scale quantum technology based on solid state systems and some and together with some engineering principles. So recently there's a lot of excitement uh, about quantum computers. So quantum computer is a fundamentally a new model of computation that relies on a couple of properties, uh, in particular massive uh, parallelism of the uh, of, of qubits uh, as well as entanglement, which is a uh, as a unique correlation in qubits and also as interference of, of, of their uh, amplitudes to perform uh, useful computation. As shown here, uh, for example, is uh, Google's quantum computer, which you may have seen in the news, which perform a sort of uh, perform a computation that takes about 200 seconds on your machine. But if you were to use to run a supercomputer, the fastest supercomputer today will take about 10,000 years. Um, but there may be a scaling limit to how large of a quantum computer we can build. And in that case, we may need to network separate computers together in order to build a, a larger quantum computer uh, to parallel some of the approaches, for example, in classical computing. So you can think of the network itself as, as a resource, like the internet, for distributing quantum information. So a quantum network can be thought of basically an, as an internet of quantum, proce uh, quantum processors, uh, sensors, or any quantum systems in general. And the power of this approach is that if we just have a uh, quantum computer, then with n number of qubits or quantum bits, then you access a computational qubit space of about of two to the n. And if you just have independent quantum computers, m of them, then you just have you know, m times two to the power of n scaling. However, if you manage to build a quantum link between all the systems, then potentially you can access a, a, a computational qubit space of two to the power of m times n. So um, typically these are connected by photons, so they can be photons at any frequencies, for example, microwave to optical. And so that presents us a, a, a very exciting opportunity to, call, to, to connect uh, in, a quantum, in a quantum fashion, different sorts of quantum technologies. For example, you can have quantum computers based on trapped ions uh, or superconducting systems or, or atoms. So the way you would do it is you have uh, some sort of quantum link. And as I said, you can, this can be local you know, in the same lab or even metropolitan or even intercon intercontinental. And um, the problem always is, is photon loss. So because of no cloning theorem, you would need, uh, in order to solve this, uh, this photon loss problem, you would also need to place a quantum uh, system in between, this, uh, in between these quantum uh, computers. And this is known as a quantum repeater. Um, so uh, the problem as we all, as we're building any quantum, quantum technology is that you would need many of these. So uh, for example, here we have a quantum repeater based on the technology I'm gonna tell you about, but we, we don't, we need more than just one of these and possibly need to build uh, many of them. So um, we need to figure out a way to manufacture these at scale. Uh, for the pod. So these are some of the examples of quantum networks that have been realized over the past decade. So for example, you have trapped ions, atoms, quantum qubits, and also defects in uh, defect qubits in diamond. So in Boston, we are also hard at work. For example, in our group and together with uh, MIT Lincoln Labs, we have demonstrated uh, quantum key distribution over, uh, over, over, over 40 kilo kilometers of, of a fiber link. Now the goal is to build a quantum uh, network that transmits quantum information from one node to, uh, to another. 
And to do this, we need to store the quantum, the quantum information in some sort of a memory. And this is known as a quantum memory. Um, so as, as you can see that if you're trying to deploy this in the real system, in the real world, we should be able to, we, the system doesn't uh, uh, needs uh, to not only to be high performing, but it also has to be able to be manufactured reasonably well. And so our platform of choice is the uh, solid state artificial atoms with optical interfaces. So this is the outline of my talk today. First, I'm gonna give a really brief introduction to um, artificial atoms uh, uh, in diamond for quantum technologies and also, also for photonics for quantum technologies. And in particular, I'll be discussing uh, some selected results uh, that would help us get towards this, uh, towards this scalable uh, quantum technology based on artificial atoms. So briefly, this is the, the I'm gonna give a brief introduction to diamond. So it has a large band gap and it's, it's a clean material. So it's basically silicon, but if you replace all the silicon with carbon, then you get uh, time. So it is mostly spin zero. So that's really good for quantum uh, information because now you can have a really clean lattice. And because of that, we can have, uh, uh, if you have electrons that are trapped in this diamond, you can have uh, milliseconds of spin condensed time, which is, which is remarkably long. And they behave like, like atoms, like, uh, like, like a real atom would. They have, you know, they have a state dependent optical readout, which just basically means that the, the brightness of that defect depends on the state of the, uh, the internal state of the atom. So the nice thing about these defects is also they have dopants or, or, and, and which have uh, nuclear spins and nuclear spins uh, are, uh, doesn't really interact with their environment. So you can, you can even use these nuclear spins as ancillary qubits to store uh, uh, the quantum dimension over a minute. And the best thing is that there are hundreds of optically active defects in diamond and we've only scratched the surface of what can be used for quantum technologies. So this is perhaps the most famous one, which is the nitrogen vacancy center, which is basically uh, uh, two missing carbon atoms in a diamond lattice. And one of it is uh, being replaced by a nitrogen and the other is left vacant. So this is the nitrogen vacancy center. And this is one of the workhorse <coughs> of, 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 of of quantum technologies based on diamond. But as, as I said, there are over hundreds of these. And in fact, you can just buy a book and you, know, you can study all the spectroscopic lines in diamond. And this is the reason why as well, if, you're, if you ever uh, bought uh, a jewelry based on diamond, they come in various different colors. And these, basic, these colors are basically different defects and defect densities in diamond. So there are really lots of opportunities here. Um, but <clears throat> if this, <clears throat> excuse me, so if, <clears throat> so they are so you know if they're so great you know where's the diamond quantum computer? Turns out whereas these systems are really exciting um, for quantum mechanical experiments, there are some serious practical challenges that we need to solve in order to make this a, a scalable quantum technology. So the first thing is uh, diamond is a is uh, and the qubits in diamond are quite inefficient, and that means that we need to do some sort of photonic engineering in order to make the uh, uh, all the relevant rates higher. The second thing is, this is a solid state system. So you can imagine that every, every defect in diamond looks slightly different from one another. So yes, there's this problem of uh, indistinguishability. So they look different from each other and, they, and so they don't interact. So we need to also overcome this problem, which is it's an active area of research. And, the, and perhaps the largest challenge is that whereas we can build small systems, uh, and <clears throat> we all know from engineering you know, that if you want to build something large out of something imperfect, then you have this period of end scaling where you know, and where you can exponentially suppress uh, uh, yields in terms of uh, in terms of the large when you try to build a large system. So to solve this, there um, we propose to use photonics. <clears throat> so the first thing that we need to see, realize is that solid state systems, solid state emitters itself have low uh, internal efficiencies. So if you, this is a spectrum of the zero uh, of the NV center that I talked about recently, uh, just a couple of slides ago. And you can see the, there's only one, there's this narrow sharp line, uh, which is useful for quantum information, but then you also have these unwanted sideband emission that's not useful for uh, the, uh, some of the protocols that we want to, that, you, that uses the NV for quantum information. And this only constitutes 3% of the emission. So you can imagine <clears throat> that our rate really suffers when we try to build a many um, uh, syst uh, qubit systems based on this uh, technology. And then you have the external efficiency problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, diamond is a high index material, in index of fraction of 
which means that most of the light emitted by the uh, by the uh, emitter is is confined in the in the uh, in the bulk material itself. So if you try to just use a you know some high end uh, optics uh, microscope, you only collect one to five percent of the emitted photons. And so what people have done usually is they typically build a you know some sort of solid immersion lens and uh, get really fancy in their in their optical setup using adaptive optics, and then that brings you to uh, to fifteen percent, which is remarkable, but still far from uh, getting us to, to unity efficiencies. So um, integrated photonics, on the other hand, you know, it's a really promising technology. It allows us to do low loss photon manipulation on the chip, and we can potentially get to extraction, uh, photon extraction with near unity efficiencies. And most excitingly uh, is the prospects for really compact and dense integration. So for example, here, there are over hundreds of uh, optical elements on a single chip. Um, and that is uh, really the, uh, the vision here where we're trying to build uh, you know, a large, rather a modestly large um, uh, quantum system on a, a fully on, on an integrated chip. So to build this scalable system, we therefore pursue hybrid integration. And the principle is, is as follows. So Diamond is a, is a great host for qubits, but it does not you know, fulfill the diverse architectural requirements for large scale quantum information processing. So in particular, uh, there's uh, the optical losses in diamond is, 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 still, is still high. It's orders of magnitude higher uh, compared to state-of-the-art photonic platforms such as silicon nitride and lithium nitride. And diamond also does not have uh, you know, you know, strong optical nonlinearities or pairs of electricity. So it's mostly a, 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 a passive photonic devices. Um, so we set out to, with the goal to combine the best uh, materials uh, for quantum and classic, uh, for, from, from both quantum and classical photonics, and diamond being the best material to date for, for it's one of the best materials to date for quantum, and aluminum nitride and silicon nitride being excellent photonic platforms in the visible. Uh, so we, we, we want to combine these, these technologies together. And this gives us the ability to optimize both materials separately and then heterogeneously integrate them together. So for example, here we can fabricate a, a photonic integrated circuit based on. In this example, a little nitride on the sapphire photonics, and then uh, also separately fabricate the diamond and then uh, the diamond nanostructure, and then integrate them uh, after the fact, and then you get this sort of uh, hybrid integrated photonics that that has this quantum element, which is the you know the quantum core, which is the diamond containing these artificial atoms with spins, and then you perform all your photon manipulation and routing all using a different material that is low loss and has have uh, have uh, can perform active. Uh, active control of this uh, photonic states. And then this allows us to shift all the technical com uh, complexities of, of building a you know, monolithic system all into the more mature fabrication platform and then uh, use the diamond for what it's good at, which is uh, for, uh, for hosting these uh, quantum, uh, quantum emitters. So, but to get there first, we have to build this diamond nanostructures. And that turns out to be really challenging because diamond, as you all know, is, is a really hard hard material physically, and it also doesn't really react with, uh, with chemicals. So fabrication and is typically very really challenging with the system. So to do that, we, we, we adopt this process called the quasi-isotropic etching, which allows us to, to, to fabricate sus, uh, suspended nanostructures directly in bulk diamond. So the, the fabrication is as follows. First, we use EV lithography and, and, and reactive ion etching to define the, the general shape of the device that we want in diamond. And then we, we use conformal coding in the form of, uh, of, of uh, atomic layer deposition in order to uh, protect all the side walls and also the top surfaces of the device. And then we remove, selectively remove the top surface of the, of the coding, the conformal coding, and that leaves the side wall protected, but the top surface is exposed. And then what we do is we do uh, reactive ion etching, but without any bias. So basically, the the, the ions that etch, the the gas that etch, that etches diamond, which is oxygen, to form carbon dioxide, basically it doesn't have any bias, so it reacts uh, chemically with, with the diamond, and this basically does a, uh, a, a, a isotropic etching along the crystal planes of the diamond. And by doing a time etch, we and after removing the mask, we end up with a suspended uh, photonic structure directly on the surface of bulk diamond. And these are the fabrication results. As you can see, various steps of fabrication and the final step of fabrication, we end up with, uh, with uh, uh, really nice uh, suspended structures on the surface of bulk diamond. 
So we did this with 1D, uh, 1D structures. We can make waveguides look like crystals, uh, which are uh, cavities on, uh, on, or resonators on a, a nanoscopic level. But we, a year later, we also managed to extend this process into, uh, into some sort of a planar photonics platform. So that allows us to do significantly more in terms of the, uh, in terms of the types of devices we can fabricate. We can now start to think about um, you know, uh, uh, importing some of the uh, some of the more mature designs, some of the more exciting designs from other parts of photonics into directly into diamond, and also use it for cavity QED experiments and things like that. But the, the what I really want to talk about today is the the core of this chip, which is the quantum photonic, uh, what we call the quantum photonic chiplet, and they they are basically an array of uh, of, of waveguides in diamond, and. And so this is the fabrication of this. So this is basically a, for example, here shown is an eight channel uh, chiplet, a photonic chiplet that we can, that, that is suspended in diamond. And here's a 16 channel uh, photonic chiplet in diamond. And back to this platform, uh, back to this image again. So what we did then is we fabricated the, the photonic integrated circuit in, uh, in a different material, which is of nitride. And we co-designed it such that it fits with this, uh, with this photonic chiplet that I just showed. And um, now we just have to find a way to integrate these two materials together. And the way we, uh, so be, but before that, I would like to talk about how we um, fabricate the artificial atoms in diamonds. So we also use a, a fabrication process based on uh, focus ion beam. So the focus ion beam instead of a, is basically like, you know, basically like a SEM microscope, but instead of electrons, it's replaced by, um, so some other form of ions. In this case, we use silicon, silicon or germanium. And this is basically, again, like a microscope. So it's, it's, like, it's a focus beam that we shine onto the surface of diamond. And then after annealing and some little bit of chemical treatment, we end up with, you know, uh, under the microscope uh, with an array of qubits that look like this. So each bright spot here is a, is a color center, a quantum emitter in diamond, basically a qubit. And uh, this allows us to create in a in a in a regular in you know in some sort of regular grid in a in a, in a, in a some, with somewhat high yield uh, array of color centers uh, uh, for for subsequent integration. And then if you and then we we align the um, uh, these chiplets using uh, even lithography. And after fabrication, you can see that um, you can see under the microscope that you end up with these bright spots in the waveguides. And each of these bright spots, again, is this quantum emitter. So we successfully basically integrated uh, these qubits into, um, into every channel of this, um, of, this, of this chiplet. And this is why we like this chiplet uh, you know, framework is because you can see here that for this eight channel chiplet, you know, every, every, each, of, each and every waveguide in this chiplet contains at least one uh, qubit. So this can be, uh, this, this is basically a really useful uh, uh, chiplet because now if we just integrate this one by one, then we basically get to uh, you know, overcome the exponential uh, scaling, the exponentially suppressed scaling of building a large system by just, by just using these chiplets and then uh, uh, for integration. Uh, conversely, if you just look at this 16 channel chiplet, you get to see, you see that you know, not, every, um, not every waveguide in this chiplet contains um, an emitter. And this is typically the trade-off, you know, when you try to build, you know, a hybrid system, you know, when you have, uh, you, you, you would like to optimize the, you know, the size of your, your die or your, or your chiplet in order to maximize the yield uh, of this, of this, uh, uh, in this heterogeneous integration process. So again, um, the, the way we integrate these quantum photonic chiplets into the, um, into the photonic circuits is we use uh, um, a pick and place integration. So this is literally a uh, what it does is we take a needle and we uh, uh, remove a chiplet one by one and populate this socket uh, in in these chiplets and, and in these photonic integrated circuits. So now you can see the power of this approach is that we have a linear scaling in the yield. So this basically the, the process of building this large scale system is now not exponential but just linear with um, the, uh, with this, the with this with uh, this success probability of this process. And again, the the, the the photonic integrated circuit is is a nitride on sapphire photonics, and there's a reference uh, for that here. And the reason why we work with nitride as our, our material is that it has high transparency, you not know, visible, and it is also it has also some is also suitable for nonlinear optics. So you can also let us uh, use it for active control of the of the photons 
uh, after the photons emitted by the quantum, uh, but the quantum emitter is coupled to the photonic, uh, uh, coupled to the photonic circuit. And in principle, that allows us to build like switches and modulators in, directly into the uh, directly or uh, into the chip, which is otherwise unavailable in in diamond. So this is the result of our uh, assembly process. So it's a 128 channel uh, uh, photonic chip, each of which containing a um, uh, at least one qubit. So it's about four millimeters big, and you know it's, it's both sides here, left side and right side here's the image, and it's a uh, it's all it's a single chip. You know it's all it's all designed and fabricated and assembled uh, in house. Um, it's uh, sixteen integrated chiplets, each of which contains eight channels. So sixteen times eight gives us one hundred twenty-eight, and um, of these one hundred twenty-eight, eight, eight, eight are, of them are waveguide coupled germanium and vacancy centers. It's a it's a type of uh, quantum emitter. And 40 of them are silicon vacancy centers, not a type of quantum emitter. And uh, because of because it's now in a different platform, we can also use the uh, the you know the, you know, the we can also access the different layers in the photonic circuits in order to build electrodes into it and enable us to control uh, the optical transitions of these emitters. So this is the uh, SEM image of the, the the quantum socket and the core. So this is the um, the uh, this is the aluminum nitride. Uh, uh, photonic integrated circuit, the PIC, and then there's a socket here where it where we can place the diamond. And so we place the diamond here with relatively good accuracy. And uh, so shown here in blue is the diamond, and in yellow is the uh, nitride photonic circuit. And this basically allows us to transfer the photons from the diamond emitted from the quantum emitter and diamond into the photonic integrated circuit for uh, photon uh, manipulation. And the way this hybrid photonics uh, uh, circuit works is as follows. So normally, if you just have a suspended diamond, the, the mode uh, the mode profile looks like uh, like like this. It's highly confined in the high index diamond. And if you just have a photonic circuit, this is how you look like. It's uh, it's it's uh, also confined in the um, nitride in the higher index material. And the way we make this uh, transfer from the diamond into the um, nitride is by by tapering that, by, uh, by introducing an interaction region uh, between the diamond and the aluminum nitride. So the way this interaction is achieved is by tapering the diamond and also the, the aluminum nitride such that it forms a, uh, a super mode that looks like this. And by going through this uh, transition, uh, idiomatically, we can basically transfer the light from the diamond layer up here into the aluminum nitride with over 95% coupling uh, efficiencies in design. Experimentally, we get a little bit less. We get about 35% exper uh, experiment, uh, but we I think we know why, why that is. So this is the setup that we use to characterize the, se the setup, so the, uh, the system. So the, the whole chip is placed into a 4K cryostat, which has a, an, a, an objective uh, outside the cryostat for imaging purposes. And also in it, we have a fiber that allows us to read out from the photonic circuit. So uh, you can have, uh, we can perform basically our experiments using either from the top or through the fiber, but because these are the, the basically, but because these are integrated system, this is the real power of, of this approach is everything can be interfaced with a fiber network. So the, one of the measurements that we, we did was measuring the, the uh, you know, uh, uniquely, uh, uniquely quantum, uh, 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 nominal, which is photon anti-bunching. So because because the, the the because we are dealing with single emitters here, the photons emitted by the uh, uh, by the single emitters are emitted as single photons. So if you try to detect um, the statistics, if you try to measure the statistics of these uh, photons, you would see that they emit photons one by one, and which means that if you try to measure a coincidence at in along in two detectors, you would not see um, any coincidence between in the detectors because the photons are emitted one by one. And, it's, and indeed, that's what we see. So the photons that are coupled through the from the emitter to, through the waveguide and into the fiber, and then onto the detectors all have these uh, statistics where the, the, the photons have, have this so-called anti-bunching behavior where they don't em, they emit, uh, where the, the statistics are basically one by one photon emission. And we see that across all channels, you know, whether it's germanium vacancy or silicon vacancy centers. So this basically verifies that the light that we're getting off chip are, is, is, is quantum in nature. Uh, so this is the summary of the, you know, the statistics. So basically uh, this value here below 0.0, anything that, be, that is below 0.5 tells us that we are dealing with a single emitter. 
So basically, in all 128 channels, we have uh, this uh, quantum statistics of uh, uh, anti bunching in all in all channels. Uh, we can do some integrated quantum photonics experiment. For example, um, we can send light through the fiber and also detect the, the emitted photons through the fiber and, and do uh, spectroscopy. And so there's no, it's, there's no any free space optics involved. Everything's quantum chip. And we can basically do, again, we can do spectroscopy and verify and measure the line widths and, and uh, measurements like that all with a fiber. And this is, is really useful as an all fiber a spectroscopic tool because if you're trying to build, you know, many of these systems and deploy them in many different repeater stations, then you uh, you would want everything to be utilizing, you know, the fiber network, existing fiber networks, and fiber optic-based technologies. Um, we can also measure the the the, the photon fluorescence uh, directly on the chip and with high signal and noise ratio, and we can also see uh, photon interference uh, effect where if we send a photon through the through the emitter. Uh, when we send a laser through the emitter, we see that the uh, the transmission of the laser ex is extinguished when it passes through the emitter. So it's basically like a single atom switch that controls whether or not a laser passes through the waveguide. So that's, that's also really exciting. And But perhaps, perhaps the most uh, important metric here is that if you just take a look at the, uh, the coherence properties of these photons emitted by these emitters, we see that they are all close to the Lifetime limit. So what 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 the lifetime limit is is basically the you know it's basically the radiative uh, lifetime of the emitter. So that gives you a, that get in in a Fourier transform relation that gives you you know a limit on what kind of bandwidth of a photon that you can get from this emitter. So typically, if you have uh, noise in your system, for from example due to nanofabrication or stray uh, fields in the uh, such as electric fields or magnetic fields, that causes wandering of the frequency of the emitter and that is basically defaces the the, the 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 photon so the temporal shape of the the temporal properties of the photons are typically uh, degraded in nanostructures and in uh, uh, but here we see that uh, we recover this so-called lifetime limit in in all of the systems so this is really exciting because we are, after doing uh, significant nanofabrication and also hyper integration we maintain the the quantum coherence of the of the of the photons emitted by the system, and because it's a you know now we have a like a three D uh, uh, cross section, we can start to put electrodes uh, in the system, so we can put uh, 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 basically uh, different layers of uh, electrodes, uh, gold for here for example, and this allows by applying a voltage, this allows us to basically bend the diamond. And because when you bend the diamond, you're basically distorting the, the lattice of the defect near the defect, and that basically causes the shape of the, the you know the, the basically causes the transition of the um, optical transition of the system to shift. And indeed, by by sweeping the voltage, we can see that the the emitted frequency shifts correspondingly, and that allows us to basically tune the um, emission of the photons uh, by some tens of gigahertz. And what we did with that is what was we, if we just take a look at different emitters uh, if, in different waveguides, we can see that they, because as I said, it, the solid state systems are slightly different from one another, they all emit at slightly different frequencies or wavelength. But by applying a voltage, we can selectively um, align uh, any pair of these three emitters together at distinct voltages. And this basically sets the stage for us to do some sort of photon interference between these emitters, which is a resource for generating entangle, uh, remote entanglement between these em em emitters. Uh, with that, I'd like to end with a summary and outlook for my uh, for this platform. Uh, so first, we've demonstrated a versatile te uh, technology platform for diamond photonics, allowing us to fabricate various structures in diamond, uh, nanostructures in diamond. And then we managed to uh, to achieve this large scale integration of quantum uh, diamond chiplets with photonics, which now allows us to build relatively uh, uh, large uh, quantum systems based on uh, based on this technology platform, and the, really the next challenge ahead is to really coherently connect all these channels together um, uh, in a quantum way, so that we can you know um, use the power of quantum mechanics for this uh, uh, quantum speedups in this and quantum security in this network and computing uh, protocols. But there's a lot of work to be done still, so. Um, We've only managed so far to, you know, demonstrate as, as a, you know, a, you know, some sort of experimental blueprint how we may build a large 
a relatively large uh, quantum system based on uh, imperfect and low yield systems. But now we have to, now that we, you know, confident that we can, we have a path ahead. Now really, it's, it's all about bringing in more advanced optoelectronics and uh, and in order to, you know, realize uh, and make use, make take advantage of the power of integrated photonics. So, for example, integration of modulator switch, switches and for, and 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 detect and detectors in the photon detectors would be crucial as in the next step of this technology towards building a, um, a, a, a integrated quantum computing uh, and scalable uh, scalable quantum computing uh, architecture. So, with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, my uh, uh, advisor, Professor Doug England, and our, our collaborators at Sandia National Labs that has this has that allows us to that has this tool that allows us to build this focus ion beam of uh, 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 of of quantum emitters and various funding agencies, and in particular in, in the lab, like thank uh, my uh, my co-author, Song Ju Lu and Sarah Muradin, and also various other people who contributed uh, to, the, to, to this project. Um, that I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm open to take questions. Well, thank you so much. This was a very inspiring talk. It is uh, remarkable what uh, we now can do, thanks to the talents of people like you in uh, patterning, forming diamond waveguides, uh, and then actually imprinting on it optical nanostructures, uh, hence allowing us to think about diamond optics. Um, I am uh, going to start with some questions. I would encourage the audience to send in a chat or by raising a hand uh, additional questions so that we can have uh, even more insights into this remarkably good topic. Um, the, I mean, I guess, let me start with uh, uh, just uh, the technique of patterning diamond itself, which uh, I, I'm very impressed in the way that you are able to clearly do the etching, and then by providing some sapphire or aluminum oxide, be able to selectively choose how to do isotropic or non-isotropic etching. Um, how does the defect on the edges of the waveguide affect uh, the performance of what you're observing? Uh, is the edge of the waveguide providing you additional interference with your quantum signals? Uh, or certainly it will provide some amount of roughness that might diminish your optical transmission. But um, I guess more importantly, does it interfere in any way uh, with the observation of your uh, resonant responses that you're hoping for? Yes, uh, thanks for the uh, really excellent question. So yes, uh, so this is a, is a is a very active area of topic where where people are investigating the effects of nano fabrication on the properties of the emitter itself. So as we're all aware, like surface roughness and um, I mean like edge and sidewall roughness, things like that, obviously affects the optical uh, optical properties of the device. However, they all they're also uh, potential traps for charges and uh, deleterious defects in diamond where they can cause, you know, uh, uh, defacing of the emitters. So basically they are little, you know, current sources basically that causes uh, magnetic fields and, and also uh, stock shifts in the, 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 um, in the emission of the emitter itself. So these are, you know, things that are gonna, you know, shift the frequency of the emitter or uh, the, the long scale or fast time scale. So these things really affect the properties of the emitters. So, I do not have much insight to offer other than the fact that um, um, with a good nanofabrication process, you eliminate most of these effects. And the evidence for that is when you try to measure the coherence of the emitted photons, and you see that they are close to what you know what you can achieve uh, just you know uh, from the uh, fundamentally from the from the lifetime of the emitter. So that means that the effects of this uh, is probably quite reduced. In, Currently, yep. So maybe I'll extend that question uh, by looking at your field affected change in the resonance. I believe maybe it was slide 27 that uh, showed the ability to apply bias uh, between the top and the bottom electrode and consequently shift the frequency of the response. Um, you associated that shift uh, with the lattice strain inside the diamond and consequently the lattice strain and the vacancy that might be emitting, um, as opposed to saying that this might be due to the charging of the waveguide or just the presence of the free electrons in the vicinity of the uh, emitter. Um, 
is there a way to distinguish between the two? Is the second effect I mentioned really not relevant because uh, the lattice strain is much more significant? Could you possibly comment on that? Yes, so that is a really excellent question. So this is a really, uh, uh, here we are using this emitter here, which is a, uh, I think I mentioned is the silicon vacancy or the germanium vacancy. And what's really exciting about these emitters is that they are symmetric in their, in their, in their shape. So they're actually uh, insensitive to electric fields to first order. So they don't have a you know, DC stop shift. So, and in fact, that's what people observe. We try to apply electric fields on these emitters. They do not shift to until you apply a strong enough electric field. And um, so these, and so here is basically uh, a, it's a, it's basically a, like a diamond MEMS here. It's like a microelectric uh, structure that uh, here's a capacitive uh, uh, structure that allows us to basically deflect the diamond. And that's what we attribute to uh, the, uh, and this is called strain tuning, I guess, of the emitter. So and this, is, this is likely the, the most dominant uh, effect in, 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 the, in the shift of this frequency here that we observe. But yeah, that's a, that's a, good, that's a really good question. I think. Well, I, I guess the other signature of this is your line width doesn't seem to, well, it is affected somewhat, but in not a direct, <laughs> in not yeah. a, a linear way. Uh, it does go from 40 to 80, even 90 uh, megahertz. Yeah. So, which I guess you're still associating though with the distortion of a lattice as opposed to with the presence of charges in the vicinity. Exactly. And um, let me see if I have a slide for that. So. Yes, so here we see, uh, we just apply um, uh, different voltage and we monitor the, the, the frequency of the emitter over, over a long time scale. We can see that, yes, they move around, but within a single, within a, you know, within a short time scale, they're actually still, you know, lifetime limited. So, um, so this, this, is more, this is probably due to the common drift in the system. And, and you can see that as you apply larger than this drift becomes uh, uh, of the emitter frequency and the frequency tend to become uh, larger. And this is probably due to the fact that now, as I mentioned that they were, these are symmetric emitters so that they, they are quite insensitive to, um, to, uh, to first order uh, perturbations in the, in the system. And by applying large enough strain, you're actually you're breaking that symmetry. And so that's why you probably see more uh, shifting in, in the frequency sometimes. But yeah, but the fact remains that they, but the fact remains that they, the center frequency itself shifts uh, with the, uh, with, uh, strongly shifts with the applied, applied bias. Excellent. Um, I understand there are a few questions in the chat. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see the questions. So I would ask the participants uh, that do have questions um, to, uh, possibly raise your hand uh, and uh, I will call upon you and you can verbally ask it. My apologies for that, for the technical glitch of me not seeing the actual chat question. Uh, great, uh, Noel, great presentation. Thank you, very educational. Um, can I ask you how the etching is done? Do you guys use like lithography or any specific methodologies? Yes, um, so let me see. So, uh, which type are you interested? So we use standard uh, processing tools like ICP RIE to etch the mask and the diamond itself. Uh, and then we use, um, for, for, for the coding of the sidewalls, we use atomic layer deposition. And in terms of metrology, we, it's you know, uh, uh, most, mostly just uh, scanning electron microscopy of the devices. Got it. Uh, may I ask a second question? And that is, uh, I noticed you use gold plating some of these? Is there gold plating? Uh, yes, so uh, yes, I do not have a slide for the fabrication of the electrodes. Yes, they are gold and we did it via liftoff. Uh, not, uh, yeah, not, not. I just want to uh, understand yeah. the reason you're using gold. Uh, it's the material, it's the uh, emitting power from the gold as a material. Uh, no, we, we, we just wanted a conductor and gold was the you know, most conductor, uh, one of the easiest things to From do. From a conductor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Great. Is, is there any stiction issues between gold and diamond as you deposited? Um, you, it, I assume you need an interstitial layer of some sort. Oh, yes. Uh, we, we use uh, titanium uh, as an addition layer. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, the time is running out, but let's uh, just call upon Dimitri. I understand, Dimitri, you might also have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Noel. And my question is that related to the inhomogeneity sort of challenge you mentioned at the beginning. So how similar are the um, uh, these qubit emitters to each other? And what is the figure of merit? Or is there a single figure of merit to sort of uh, evaluate quantitatively this um, inhomogeneity? Thank you. Thanks for that great question. So, um, so uh, as you can, as, as I've shown here, it's like even though each of these emitters are, you know, they have really good coherence properties, but the center frequency of these emitters are not quite homogeneous. And uh, if I remember correctly, the numbers are on, on the order of 50 to 100 gigahertz. So they are all narrow, you know, tens of megahertz, but they, you know, their distribution of the center frequency is over, over hundreds of, over 50 to, 100, 50 to 100 gigahertz. And this problem usually gets worse in nanostructures because now you have, um, you know, built in uh, lattice strain and things like that, that, you know, and, and due to fabrication as well, that causes the shift of the uh, standard frequency. And that's why it's really important to implement uh, an integrated solution to, you know, once you integrate these uh, emitters into the circuits, you also need an integrated solution to controlling them. So, um, so here, we, for example, we've shown that we can control, we can shift the frequency by tens of gigahertz as well to compensate for uh, these uh, inhomogeneities. And in this experiment here, we've shown that even though they, you know, they start off some tens of gigahertz apart as well, you know, at applying distinct voltages, we can, you know, choose any pair of them to align to align to the same spectral band, basically. Um, not sure if um, that answered your question. The, yeah. Okay, thank I, you. <laughs> thank you, Dimitri. Um, the time is running out, but let's just put one more question, given how uh, excited the audience is about your talk. Um, if we could just call upon Daniel. Hi, uh, really nice work, uh, Noel. So I have a question on how you exactly integrate these triplets. Like, can you comment a bit more on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me get back to that. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, we use a probe here. This is a standard probe that uh, people use in, for example, focus ion beam uh, uh, metrology. And this is a tungsten probe that is, you know, has a really small tip. You know, the radius of curvature is about uh, one micron, I believe. And basically, this probe sits on a uh, uh, on a piezo stage that we move under the microscope. And this, you know, oh, sorry, this literally is as as this animation was showing. It's we come in and we pick it up and put it into the photonic circuit. And yeah. <laughs> Is that, is that, I hope that answers the, que answers the question. So, so you just break it out with that needle itself and then it sticks there and then you can nicely transfer it to your, like yes. uh, to the other right. chip. Yeah, oh, so it nice. ni it nicely works out that it's, it, you know, the, it sticks to the probe, but it sticks, but the diamond sticks stronger to the, to the circuit than it, than it does to the probe. So it would all works out well in that sense. I'm sure it takes a steady hand to do that. <laughs> oh, it's all it's all it's all piezo control, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Noel, I and I thank you very very much for an extremely uh, stimulating talk. Uh, it is indeed uh, clear to us that the quantum computing gauges upon us, and it's indeed advancements of your your colleagues, groups like Dirk Englund's group that are going to indeed bring it uh, bring that into reality for the rest of us. Thank you so much uh, for giving us this nano explorations talk. Let me uh, applaud you. Uh, I indeed encourage the audience to do the same. And as we are thanking Noel, I will also uh, just announce the next talk. The next nano explorations will happen in two weeks from now on February 16th. Our speaker is uh, James McRae, um, a mechanical engineering PhD candidate. And the topic of his talk will be silicate-based composites as heterogeneous integration packaging material for extreme environments. So I do hope you can join us in a couple of weeks and get another amazing talk uh, by our students. Noel, congratulations on finishing your PhD last week. And I wish you all the best in your next set of great adventures. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, my pleasure. Bye. All the best to all. Take care.